Welcome to Kill Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. This is a show about innovation and creativity and how to take your ideas and turn them not just into good ideas, but great ideas, breakthrough ideas, or what we call here on this show, killer innovations. Now, we've been doing this show for quite some time. We are now in year 16 and uh, been, have been focused on a variety of different topics and areas. We have guests on the show um, covering a wide range of sharing their innovation stories. Uh, this week, we are actually picking up where we left off in last week's show. So last week's show was out-of-the-box thinking, uh, a phrase, buzzword that's been out there for quite some time. And as I said at the end of last week's show, that that was part one. Today, we are going to pick it up and be focused on part two. And what do I mean by part two? Part two focuses on a couple of different areas, but before we get into that, let's back up and talk about, or at least set the stage for what we discussed uh, during last week's show. And last week was, first of all, let's define what we mean by out of the box thinking. Now what we mean by out of the box thinking, it's thinking is a, out of the box is a metaphor. And it really is to think differently, unconventionally, or, and or from a new and different perspective. It basically gets wrapped up in the concept of think differently. Think doing from a different perspective. Think from uh, not your normal patterns or your normal rut on how you think about uh, the ideas and uh, where you source your ideas or how you make decisions in a normal thought pattern. Think differently when we talk about out of the box. Now, in last week's show, we focused on the first two, which was to think differently and think unconventionally. This week, we're going to talk specifically about from a new perspective. But again, before we jump into the new content for part two here, I want to go back and lay a little bit of the, the foundation from last week. Now, if you haven't listened to the previous show, I would encourage you to do so, because I'm just going to cover this in just a few minutes here at the beginning of this show, just to remind everybody what they heard last week, put it in a little bit of context, and then we're going to jump right into how do you think and how do you put yourself in a position such that you can see from a different perspective, not your normal perspective that you go after and solve ideas, solve problems, etc. How do you think from a new perspective? But before we jump to that, let's talk through the, uh, the things that we talked about last week. So, specifically, we started off last week talking about thinking styles. We all have a preferential thinking style. Are you a synthesis, an idealist, a pragmatist, an analyst, a realist? Now, some of us may be, uh, I don't know, maybe multiples, right? So I'll tend to be much more of a synthesis. I'm more into the idea of creation. But then I'm also an analyst. I like to dig into. I read a lot. I'm a, I'm a, I, I, I believe information is power. Um, it helps build knowledge. So I, I analyze. I collect information. I'm a little bit of an information hoarder, <laughs> Um, as my, uh, my family and my wife uh, will attest. I have, uh, for instance, in my uh, studio here, I have more books than uh, pretty much I would guess just about anybody out there. So what is your thinking style? It's important that you understand your thinking style first because then that also recognizes or helps you recognize that there are other people with different thinking styles. You may be a synthesis, but somebody else may be an idealist or a pragmatist or an analyst or a realist, right? I'm not going to go through the definitions of these. Again, uh, check out part one of the series uh, to give you kind of the definitions for each of these thinking styles, and it'll help you kind of bucketize yourself, which of these thinking styles you fall into. And again, you may not fall into just one thinking style. You may actually be, you know, kind of in two. As I said about myself, I'm a synthesis, which is someone who thinks about ideas and connects the dots and et cetera. Um, but I'm also an analyst. 
I like information, I like data. Um, so you may have two different thinking styles. And the key here is, is to recognize that people have different thinking styles. And because you don't have all thinking styles, you will naturally have blind spots. You will naturally have biases because of the thinking styles and how you come up with your ideas or how do you solve a problem, etc. So, uh, and then the other piece that we talked about was think differently. Now, think differently tells you that you should actually go through all seven of these um, ways of thinking whenever you're working on projects or whenever you want to come up with new ideas or just as part of a normal process to kind of give yourself, uh, you know, maybe that little spark to come up with something new, right? So, for instance, you want to cultivate strategic thinking. You want to engage in inquisitive thinking, which is asking questions. You want to explore big picture thinking. Step back, take it all in. You want to harvest focused thinking. Get yourself away, really focus on a particular problem, area, opportunity that you want to really spend some time on. You want risk-oriented thinking. You know, take off the, the handcuffs. Go off and do and think of things that maybe could be potentially very high risk for your organization. Rely on shared thinking. Look, innovation is not an individual activity. It's a team sport. Get that shared thinking. And practice reflective thinking. Stand back, take a, little, take a deep breath, particularly if you're in the throes of coming up with ideas and you think you got something great, you want to go out and just launch with it, maybe take a little bit of that, get reflective. Um, if you do things out of emotions or as a reaction to something, it may not be the best, but at the same time, reflective thinking allows you to kind of maybe take a step back, take a breath, close your eyes, take it, and then think about what is it you should be doing, right? That reflective, just that, that, that pause, that pause could be just 15 seconds, just as I just did. Or it could be take an idea, put it away for a week, and then come back to it and see if it's still uh, the same thing. Reflective thinking, very powerful. It's kind of that analogy that I use if you're really mad at somebody, you're mad at your boss, and you bang out that email and you're going to tell them what you think, you know, don't send it. Right? Put it in your draft folder. Go away for a couple of days, come back, reread it, and then think if you should really send it or not. That's what I mean by reflective thinking. Now, as I shared last week, the point here is, is one of these is not better than the other. What I, what I say here is, is that you should actually do all seven of these. You should actually run through all of them. And the way to do that is, is don't run them through, okay, number one, number two, number three, and punch and you know, check a box. What I would suggest you do is just schedule it on your calendar, right? So maybe an hour a week or an hour every other week, just set aside the time to do strategic thinking. You spend another uh, hour every two weeks to think about inquisitive thinking. What questions should you be asking? What questions should you be asking that you haven't asked? either by of your customers, of your suppliers, of your, um, your staff, your team that's you know, helping you achieve what it is you need to achieve. Explore the big picture. Maybe you do that with peers that are in other industries to kind of get the big view of what's going on out there. Focus thinking. Go away. You know, go take a, a two days in a cabin in the mountains where there's no internet. And you're not distracted to just focus, pick a problem statement, pick an opportunity area, and just dedicate for focused thinking. Risk-oriented. Find somebody who is more risky than you to push you through a process of thinking about ideas where they're willing to take the risk that you're not willing to take. And then shared thinking. Collect ideas. Encourage people to be transparent and honest with you. And then reflective thinking. Do all seven of these things, but set aside um, those times to, uh, to really think about um, uh, new ideas. Think differently. 
And where we're at today is we're going to talk about thinking from a new perspective. We all have a perspective. We all have a path. We all have a normal way of looking at problems, opportunities. We think we know customers. And what we're going to talk about for the rest of today's show is to change that perspective. Come at things differently. Look at things differently. And therefore, generate a different kind of ideas. Thinking from a new perspective. As we talked about in the previous segment about thinking differently, thinking in new and different ways, one of the key areas for thinking outside the box is to think from a new perspective. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that you need to change your perspective. So as you take a different route and path than the one you're on, you see things differently. Um, you, you, you may see familiar things, but you'll see them in a different light, a different perspective. Um, and when that happens, you, you know, you're going to get a different view. You're going to see things in the way that you just didn't see it, uh, before. And that is, you know, it's actually an interesting, uh, point on the, you know, why I use the term, take a different path or route. Uh, one of the challenges I give my staff is, is every week or every couple of weeks, take a different path to work. Don't drive the exact same way because we get in kind of a zone mode, right? There's probably times when you left your house, you get to work, and you don't even know how you got there. Uh, now, it's a little different given that we're in COVID right now, but, um, you know, we get kind of in this rut and we lose track of days of weeks. We don't even notice things because we just always take the exact same path. That's what we mean by changing perspective. And so we're going to talk more specifically about this. I'm going to share with you um, some approaches that you can use in order to uh, change that perspective and use it as a catalyst to really come up with new, more, and even better ideas. So first off, you got to you you get a different perspective. And getting a different perspective is hard. It is hard because we're kind of ingrained, particularly as we've grown up and we've gotten experience in our career, we just kind of get our blinders on. So what we're going to talk about really is, is these five approaches to how to get a different perspective, how to see people, see customers, see problems, see opportunities differently. And this is all wrapped into a term that we use around ethnographic studies. How do you um, use uh, social sciences and uh, uh, ethnography, to look at people and understand their perspectives, right? So let's hop into these, and I'm going to go through and give you a specific set of details and examples. So first off is observing others wh while they live and work. This is known as naturalism. Uh, this is an ethnographic research technique in which the researcher observes. You're just observing. You're not interacting. You're not poking you're just sitting back and you're just watching. You are just, you know, observing. Um, in a project that I uh, was involved in when I was at Gila Packard, we used this observing approach, this naturalism, for a project or a product that we were creating for kind of the lower middle class um, uh, society uh, members uh, uh, in India. And, and this was looking at technologies coming into the home and what kind of a device could address a key concern, which was communication between the families who stayed in India and their children who went to, they worked hard to get them through school, got them through college, and then they leave India to go to Europe or come to North America to uh, find their jobs. So it was around the communications. But we didn't want to inject and ask questions because, again, you can project your bias. We just did observational studies. We literally went and lived in people's homes. We observed them. We stayed overnight in their homes to see how they interacted, see how they communicated today. It was a real, real eye-opener for all of us on that project. The other is, is participant observation. This is watching, but you're able to ask questions. You're going to poke. You're going to ask for clarification. You're going to, why did you do this? And what were you thinking here? And the best example here is, is and I've shared this many times on the show with you, um, around my going into Best Buy and standing in a Best Buy and watching 
customers come in and buy laptops or desktop computers or printers or whatever and watch them maybe look at an HP product but choose a competitor's product and I would walk up and ask them questions like why did you go why did you choose that particular path so this is probably this participant observation is the one that I use all the time and still use it um, quite regularly interview this is where you really um, interviewing is really a way of, of a massive uh, of, of observation. We do this in the innovation boot camp where we do what we call into the wild. For the problem statement chosen, we bring customers to a dinner and through dinner, um, the students in the class ask questions of, uh, of this particular, of, of this audience about what do they like or not like about this thing or that thing, depending on what the topic is. Um, for the boot camp. The other is, is surveys. Now, survey really is about gathering information about the group. Now, the best way to do that is you ask questions. And I would suggest you think about asking different question types, whether it be scale questions, open-ended questions, multiple choice, closed-ended questions. The way you create those questions, now a variation of this is focus groups. And you've heard me in the past, I'm not a big fan of focus groups. I'm also a little, a little less enthusiastic um, about surveys. Why? Because I think you can inject bias into the survey based on the questions you're going to ask. Now, we just talked about participant observations, right? When we do the, um, uh, you know, when we do or the, we do in interviews, you know, you want to ask questions and you want to pre-plan your questions and you want a variety of different question types because they'll peel out different answers. But be very, very careful of the wording of you, whether you're going to do um, interviews or surveys. You're asking questions. The wording of the questions are absolutely critically important. You want to get that right. Um, and then the last one, which I think in many cases, you know, people overlook, which is archival research. There's been a lot of, of work that's been done by um, other researchers. Um, and you can analyze existing research and documents and other sources of information. You can learn from others and be open to that learning. Don't, you know, don't go in with a bias thinking the answer is this and you only find research that agrees with you. Find research that even disagrees with you and look at it honestly, look at it transparently. It's about changing your perspective, getting out of your comfort zone and looking at your customers, your prospects, your competitors, your industry, you yourself, you're about changing your perspective. Because if you can change your perspective, you can look for problems and opportunities to solve, to be that next great idea, because you are starting to create fresh eyes. You can look at it without kind of the constraints of how you've always done it. So get a different perspective. You can do it by observing others, participant observation, interviews, surveys, or archival research. So in this next section we're going to talk about is a number of different areas about how to walk in your customer shoes. And this is an important um, ability for any innovator is, is not to walk in your own shoes and project your beliefs or project your opinions onto your customers but it's about being able to get yourself into your customer shoes. So how do you do that? Well, first off, the, way, the best way that I have found to do this is do what I call create a customer journey map. So what is a customer journey map? A customer journey map, it's a tool that examines and, uh, how your customers experience, how do they interact with you. What's their experience from the first time they touch you all the way through the decision to buy what it is or this, your innovation that you've created? Um, now, they give you the insight for a typical journey for a customer as well as providing some insights into the interactions. But the key here is, is that you think you know how your customer reacts in the journey. Getting yourself on the other side to be that customer or to observe that customer to see how they interact with the journey. So as we talked about in the previous segment about how to research your, your customers, 
All of that is input into creating this customer journey map. And it really is about you walking in the shoes of your customers, taking that data and putting it in the context of what is your customer actually thinking, feeling, saying as they go through the experience of using your new great innovation or buying your product or service or interacting with your customer service organization or your sales teams. Every touch point with the customer is absolutely critically important. And that's what we map out in a customer uh, journey map. So what's the first thing you have to do to create a customer journey map? Well, first of all, you have to establish user persona. So user persona, very simply, is a semi-fictional character based on your current or your prospective customers. Uh, you take the collection of your customers, maybe from doing observational studies or surveying, and you may categorize them as being maybe a certain age bracket, a certain demographic, certain experience level, certain educational level, certain, in, you know, whatever the characteristic is. But this then allows you to then very simply be able to think about it in the context of, the, uh, of that customer. Now at HP, I actually used personas to force the design teams to think differently. You know, unfortunately, in Silicon Valley, most of the engineering and the engineering leadership are men. Um, and they don't have the perspective of all the potential customers that are buyers. So one of the personas that we designed to when we talked about laptops in particular was women. All right, so one of the target personas we always talked about was women. How will Julie like this product? Will this meet Julie's needs? Will this be something that Julie will respond to? And we could have that conversation. And therefore, if an engineer said, well, I liked it, well, you're not Julie, right? So you can use personas as a guide, as a signal to use yourself and your organization to get out of yourself and to think about it from the context of customers. I cannot underestimate the importance in the value of spending the time to really think about your user personas. You are not a proxy for your users. Always remember that in the innovation game. Never think you are the proxy. You need to have observed, engaged, surveyed, talked to, watch, you know, your prospect of your customers, and then you need to be able to establish these personas and think like your customer, not like how you uh, normally think. The other is you have to understand all of your customer touch points. How does your customer interact? How, how, how are they going to interact if you're going to launch some new big innovation? And it's got to be literally from start to finish, birth to grave. Um, and they may be, you know, everything from your ads, to your website, to how they're going to find out about the quality of your product, to if they're going to come into a retail store, how, what's that experience going to be like, to the interaction with your customer care, right? Because, again, you think you know how your customer wants to interact. Oh, all customers want to be self-service. All customers want to do everything. Up. No, not every customer wants that. You have to Think about each of your customer personas, each of the parts of your customers, the people who are going to be your raving fans. And that's what you're trying to create as a raving fan for your innovation. How, what is that raving fan going to want to interact? What are all those touch points either they have if you're an established business or you will create, right? And that's where you, if you look back and think about customer or businesses that have launched where everybody goes absolutely crazy for it and it becomes a huge success is they've thought about these customer touch points. They've, they, but they've thought it from the context of the customer, not from their perspective. And then another area that I think gets underserved a lot, and that is actors who influence your customers. And these are ones who, that will, inter, that will um, influence whether someone has a great experience or not such great experience, <clears throat> but these are people that are outside your control. They're not your employees. They're not your, 
your salespeople. They're not your people answering the, the telephone. These are people from outside that can influence either a positive or a negative experience. You know, example, Uber, right? You think, well, it's you and the driver, right? Well, Yes, that's that that that's those are two actors that that are in control of Uber. What they can't control is your friend sitting next to you in the Uber, right? Maybe they had a bad day, they said something, the driver reacted to it, and all of a sudden your perception of that experience of the drive changes, either positive or negative, right? So you have these other outside influences. Um, you know, in my case, going to Best Buy and watching customers buy HP product, one of the biggest influences is if someone brought a friend with them to buy the product, and if that person was maybe thought they were technical or somewhat technical, they could swing someone's buy decision in a big way, in many cases, with bad information. So that's an example of those actors. First thing you want to do when you have all this is create an empathy map. An empathy map really examines how the customer feels during each interaction. You want to know how the customer feels and thinks as well as what they will say or hear in any given situation. Um, an example of this I give is uh, Chick-fil-A. If you've ever been in Chick-fil-A and you, they hand you your drink and you go, thank you, what does the person at Chick-fil-A say? They don't say, you're welcome doesn't say, no, I, not a problem. Chick, every Chick-fil-A employee I've ever experienced will say, my pleasure. Now think about that from a customer's perspective when you say thank you, and you go, no, my pleasure. My pleasure in serving you. Changes the whole perspective, right? And that's an example of an empathy map applied to changing the feelings, to changing the, uh, the interaction experience with um, a customer, right? If you truly understand from the customer's perspective and you define that empathy map, what's the problem the customer's having? A mother, three kids running around Chick-fil-A, don't need to say thank you. It's a pleasure for me to serve you. And then you sketch the customer journey. You can do this in different ways. You can do it on a whiteboard, post-it notes. Um, you can use um, any kind of, you know, graphing software, mind maps if you're if you're into that, but you want to draft, you want to validate, it takes multiple interactions, but by putting yourself in the customer's view and seeing all those interaction points and seeing if there's ways you can make it better, easier, or solve a problem, you can create innovations that will have an absolute huge, 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 huge impact. So the key here is, is that when you get together with your team and you're trying to develop these kinds of new innovations, these new kinds of interactions, it does require a team. You've got to get the team around the table. You're gonna, you've got to put yourself in the shoes of your customers because otherwise you will have a blind spot. Building journey maps is not you by yourself. You need to have your team involved in it so that they, they can fill in all of the blind spots within the organization. So, as we started off in part one, this two-part series was about out-of-the-box thinking. It's to think differently, unconventionally, and from a new perspective. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, part one, we talked about thinking differently, which included thinking styles. So are you a synthesis, an idealist, a pragmatist, an analyst, or a realist? Which are you? Um, and again, you may have be part of uh, more than one. You may have two. In my case, synthesis analyst. Um, but it's important to understand how the others think because you can leverage that in your team. If you know someone's a realist or a pragmatist, you want to have all of these thinking styles on your team. You want to recruit people with different uh, thinking styles. And then you want to think differently. You want to take the time. Now, some of these you may, may be more natural to. You may be more of a, a strategic thinker or the inquisitive thinker. The important thing here to think differently is, is to think through all seven of these things. Force yourself, spend time, put it on your calendar to where you're going to spend an hour a week or an hour every other week to think strategically or be inquisitive or do the big picture or get down and do focused or, you know, don't let risk get in the way. In fact, you know, give yourself permission to, to not use risk as a criteria. 
Uh, do shared thinking, bring people together, maybe do a brainstorming session. Reflective, after you've got an idea well thought out, take a step back, think in a, in a reflective approach. Part two, today's show, it's about getting a different perspective, right? So, you, you know, observing others while they live and work, be a participant observation. Similar to what I would do when I would go to uh, um, standing in Best Buy, do interviews, um, invite prospects to dinner like we do at, in the innovation boot camps uh, where we'll pick a problem space, we go off and we, we have a very creative way of finding prospects for, for an area. Um, we bring them to dinner, we pay for the dinner, we actually give them um, a $50 uh, gift card, Visa gift card at the end of the dinner. It's kind of a reward, but they don't know who the company is, they don't know, you know, we're not trying to steer their answers, but it's turned out to be a pretty effective way for people to get um, a customer perspective rather than thinking they know. Do surveys, focus groups, uh, archival research, an area that's highly overlooked, but I would encourage you um, to, to, to take that time. And then once you've got all of that, create a customer journey map. Force yourself into the shoes of your customer, right? Create the user personas. Define that. Name them. You know, we, we had a persona at HP, Julie, right? So she was early 30s, two young kids. Uh, I had an undergraduate degree from college. Uh, was working and taking care of the family. Um, her job was a lot of travel, blah, blah, blah. And we, we got pretty specific on the definition of personas such that when we said, would Julie like this? Would this solve a problem for Julie? Everybody in their head could see Julie, visualize her, knew what her issues were. And these were mapped to real people or a grouping or kind of amalgamation of multiple people to make up what we thought was this definition of the personas. So take the time. Understand customer touch points. Where does a customer interact? You may think you've got a log of everything, you know, how customers interact, but uh, you may not have a complete view. And understand actors who influence your customer experience, and particularly actors you do not control, right? Because they can either help you or hurt you. And then create an empathy map. What is your customer feeling? What, when, what are they feeling when they even try to find your product? What's the are they stressed because you're, you're, you're a product that solves a, a very specific and immediate problem? Or is your thing more of a, hey, I'm looking to relax, you know, maybe I'm, uh, you're in travel or tourism, and so therefore it's a different feeling. Create the empathy map for the innovation you're creating. And then sketch the customer journey. How would you create a customer journey? Or what is your customer journey? And then what would you change to make a better overall uh, experience. So that is what we've covered over the last two parts of this show. Part one last week, part two this week. Hopefully, together they give you a, co a complete picture about what does it mean to be thinking out of the box. So, uh, again, with uh, this two part series, hopefully you found it useful. Um, and, uh, and it's just a warm up of uh, you know what we're going to be working or what we're going to be sharing in future shows is about different approaches to thinking, just sitting and thinking that can be sparks to ideas that become game changers, breakthroughs, or what we say here on this show is killer innovations. Um, if you want to get into more of this, if you want to uh, really dig into um, these you know, different types of thinking styles, check out the Disruptive Ideation Workshop. It's over at disruptiveideation.com. Um, it's either an eight or a 12 hour workshop. You can have it configured either way. This is the same workshop I've shared on this show with you uh, about the work we do at, uh, for instance, US Marine Corps, um, helping the Marines think through um, um, some of the, the work that they need to do and how do, how do innovators think about um, the Marines or the or Navy that are out there uh, doing, uh, uh, doing what they do. So uh, this is a, a workshop. It doesn't matter whether you're a profit, not-for-profit, government, 
uh, small company, multinational, this is a workshop uh, for you. So again, disruptiveideation.com. Uh, looking for feedback. Love to hear what you think of this show. Thought, think of the part one, part two. Um, things that you think we missed. Um, future topics you would like to have covered, just let us know. Um, and, uh, uh, and look forward to uh, hearing from you. Stay updated. You can text the word innovation to 44222 if you're in the U.S. Or send an email to innovation at killerinnovations.com. That will get you updated. You'll get a regular, uh, while well, you get a, a once a week email from me um, that just kind of talks about topics that I think are important that you want to stay up on. And with that, thank you for your time. Have a favor. Can you share the show with somebody? Give us a comment. Give us feedback. And with that, we'll talk to you next week right here at Kill Innovations. Bye-bye.